here that has attained some degree of success. We have among us here business owners, C-level executives, managers, leaders. We have employees, members of teams. We have people who are also uh, trying their own life goals, to set their own important goals. But everyone that has attained some certain degree of success knows that it's much more complex than just a few principles. And everybody has principles, everybody has systems. You know, some people say this system works, some people say this system works. And there is some element of truth to all the systems, right? But everybody is individual, every business is individual. So I hope to be able to help you to clarify, in the very least, your important goals, your most important goals, to help provide you with a flexible plan. I said flexible plan. Because we all know that uh, strategy and planning is important. And we all know that uh, we can be very good at strategy and planning. <laughs> but when it comes to executing even the simplest of goals, it's very easy to underestimate the possibility of execution. And that's why the execution element is included in this workshop for the first time in a personal development seminar of this nature, at least of those that I have attended. It's based on my experience with high-performing teams, global teams, and what I have seen works, and what I have seen works with my own team. I've led the learning and development team for a number of years, and I was with the Hostway Corporation up till December last year as manager global talent development. So I knew a few things about uh, <laughs> people development and reaching goals. Once again, thank you for coming. Before we go into the three sessions, first of all, Everybody has in front of them or beside them <laughs> worksheets. So you have two basic kinds of worksheets beside you. One is a blank sheet for scribbling and writing things. And it would be a good idea after each exercise to draw a line and then go to the next one. But the entire workshop is structured so that it's going to build up into something in the end. We're going to begin with pieces, and we're going to build. And um, it's most likely we are not going to finish all the exercises for the workshops later tonight, simply because everybody in this room is at different stages of life goals development and of professional development. So some people that have already given thought to this would complete the exercises quicker than others. Some people would need more time. And that's why you're going to be able to take away the worksheets with you and use the systems and use the principles and apply them in your own personal life or in your business or in your teams. Okay, so we'll start with the first sheet for the first session. And when we go into the second session, the first session is on discovery. The second session is on planning. We'll go into that. And the third session, which is the most important part, is execution. And speaking of execution, before we go into the three sessions, there are four things I would like you to know. They are things that I've seen are very important. They are not the only things, but based on my experience, my life experience, my experience in people development, which is my life passion. <laughs> First of all, you are 100% responsible for your life. I guess everybody knows that, but I don't think everybody really, really knows that or really appreciates how important this is. I've done a lot of personality tests over the years with Hogan personality assessments, with the Briggs-Meyer tests. I've been through the Kiersey tests. I've been through all kinds of personality tests that tell me I'm supposed to be an INTJ, okay? So standard coaching, right? Standard coaching on personal development would normally provide you with personality tests to get to know yourself, which is important. And you're going to do some exercises here which will help you to know yourself. Because in order to grow, you need to be aware of yourself. But in order to be aware of yourself, you also need to grow. Because sometimes I've had to face a certain task or a certain assignment. And during that project, I discovered, hey, I'm good at this. An example, when I was uh, working in Teleric, I worked with Teleric for about three and a half years before beginning my career then in people development as a training manager. And at the time, I saw that I didn't have passion to be a developer. But I had to go through certain experiences, grow through things. And it got to the point where we were working on the Teleric Trainer Package, which has now grown into what you know is the Teleric Academy. 
And um, during that time, I discovered I had a passion for training. So in order to be self-aware, you need to grow. But in order to grow, you also need to be self-aware. So it's like a catch-22. One is dependent on the other. Okay? So it's advisable to follow your passions and grow. But being 100% responsible for your life is the main thing that has helped me through life. And I believe has helped any successful person if they are honest enough with themselves. You've probably heard about Jack Canfield, author of Chicken Soup for the Soul. He sold over 500 million books worldwide. One of the most highly paid coaches in the world today. He went to work for W. Clement Stone, a millionaire, many years ago. And at the time, he was earning about $100 a month as a teacher. And W. Clement Stone asked him a question. Are you taking 100% responsibility for your life? And he said, I think so. And then Clement Stone said, okay, let me ask you three follow-up questions. Number one, please don't provide answers. Just think. <laughs> Have you ever blamed anybody for anything in your life? Ever. Second question. Have you ever complained about anything? Your boss, your job, country, the economy, your spouse? And the third question, have you ever made excuses for anything? And the answers are yes or no. <laughs> There's no in between. If you answered yes to any of these questions, Clement Stone told him, you're not taking 100% responsibility for your life. So the thing is this, in life, and this is actually foundational, far beyond everything we're going to discuss here. If this is out of place as a foundation, everything else falls apart. And the secret is this, to act as if everything that happens in my life, I either created it, I am propagating it, or I am tolerating it. One of those three things. Now someone may say that, that, that that's not true, right? There are people, there are times people have done things to me, I did good things to them, and I received bad in return. Yes, I don't deny that that's a fact. I've had things happen to me that were not my fault. I've worked for bad managers, right? <laughs> uh, I've seen a lot of things. But the secret is to act as if. It may not be true that you caused your situation, but act as if you are the one that created it, or you are the one that is allowing it to continue. And when you do that, there's a shift that happens in your mind because you become proactive instead of being a victim. So your success now depends on you. Your, su your success depends on what God has given you in terms of your personality, your ability, your talents, your strengths. And it determines, it's determined by what you are going to do with what you have been given. So to me, this is the most important principle. You being 100% responsible, are you going to succeed or not? Do you believe you will succeed? If you don't believe you succeed, like a famous person said, if you think you can, I think it's Henry Ford, if you think you can or if you think you cannot, you are most probably right. So this is the first principle. You are 100% responsible. The second foundational principle that has helped me so much is become growth conscious and not goal conscious. There's a big difference. There's a lot of talk about goals and there's been a lot of talk about goals for a long time and goals are great. Vision is great. But how many of you have noticed that there have been times in your life where you achieved a goal and then you ask yourself, what next? And people tend to plateau after they reach a goal. So in order to avoid that happening, achieving a level of success and going down, we change, there's a switch you need to switch, you need to you know, pull in your mind, such that you become growth conscious. And when you are growth conscious, the goals never stop being achieved. Because it's not a question of, I have to get a million in 10 years. It's a question of, I have to become the best me I can be. And for me, for instance, my main life goals, I have to be the best man I can be, the best husband I can be to my wife, the best father I can be to my daughter, the best people development person I know. So in order to be the best, you have to keep growing. 
you never arrive. This is a very, very important secret. Not growth conscious, not goal conscious, but growth conscious. To keep on growing. There's always more. There's always more you can learn. There's always more you can do. There are more people you can help. It doesn't matter the level of success you have arrived at. The third principle, meaning and convergence. This is a very, very powerful one because the truth is we all seek meaning. Everybody in this room, everybody on the face of the planet. We all seek meaning within ourselves. We all seek meaning with our within our relationships. We seek meaning in our work and we seek meaning in our experiences. I did a talk once at uh, Soho co-working space, the office, on, actually the talk came out of a, a movie, this movie with uh, Will Smith, In Pursuit of Happiness, you know the movie, yeah? And uh, I titled it In Pursuit of Happiness. And I found out there are these four levels. There's peace within yourself, which I find through my faith, peace within myself, peace within my soul, within my thoughts. I saw some statistics showing and there's a lot of breakthroughs of recent in the areas of neuroscience that prove that your self-talk is what determines a lot of things that happen in your life. There are grooves that are created in your brain each time you think a thought. And each time you keep going back to that thought, it deepens and deepens and deepens until it becomes a habit. It becomes a reflex. Immediately you face that kind of situation, your mind immediately starts thinking. For instance, someone may start thinking, oh, I'm going to fail again. They're not going to take me. <laughs> I won't succeed. It won't happen. And they tend to believe that and act in a certain way that causes people around them to respond in that way because they are projecting that particular image. How we see ourselves is more powerful than we choose to admit. Meaning and convergence. <clears throat> a behavioral economist by name, a professor, Dan Ariely, did some research and he has a lot of interesting research. You can see he has videos on YouTube. And he did uh, research on meaning. And he was working with an IT company with a team of people. And he found out that these people were highly productive engineers, locked up in two buildings for months, and they had to work and turn out a product. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he found out these people were depressed. They weren't happy. And he did certain experiments with them and experiments with other groups. And what he did was to different groups, he, pre he presented them with Legos used to make these bionicles like robots. And the task was everybody was to create a Lego figure, like a bionicle, okay? And get paid $3 for creating one bionicle. And um, people that wanted to do it, some people are more enthusiastic about Legos than others. At the end of the experiment, everybody that created a Lego Bionicle comes up to the team, and what they do is, in front of the person, they disassembled the Lego Bionicle into its individual Lego pieces, handed it back to the person, and said, would you like to do it again? And for one group, they offered to pay them less each time. $2.80 and $2.60, and for another group, they maintained you know, the same amount. And they found out that even those people that love Lego so much, <laughs> at a certain point they say, I'm not doing this anymore. This doesn't make any sense. There's no meaning behind it. And I have been in teams in the past where the vision has changed at least 10 times within nine months, okay? And where the leader of a team has no idea what the business goals of a team are, the manager above him or leader above him or her does not understand what the goals are, and it becomes meaningless. But the most powerful thing, even in employee engagement, is not even the different initiatives you know, that we organize for people, is to give people, first of all, meaning. Give people meaningful work. And that begins with finding people that love that particular job. People that think and dream about this. People that this work is meaningful for them, and then create an atmosphere of meaning for them. Also, concerning employee engagement programs, there's a lot of talk about what the company should do to engage people, you know, and so on. A lot of money is put into team building programs and all kinds of activities, which is great. It's, it's wonderful, right? We all get inspired by Google's offices and so on, okay? <laughs> this is part of, part of the package, right? It's really attractive. Nice office and everything. 
But with employee engagement, there's also the employee side to engagement that most times is never mentioned. Employees also have a, a responsibility to engage themselves and not always wait for somebody else to engage them. Actually, your most productive employees, if you're a manager or if you're an owner of a business, some of you here, you'll see that there are people who are self-starters, people who are proactive. Those that complain <laughs> the most, right, usually create a lot of problems that they don't really move that forward. They go to a certain point and then they stop. So meaning and convergence. A business and political strategist by name Lance Wallnau mentioned the term convergence. I ran into that term years ago, somewhere around 2010, 2011, and it really fascinated me. And he defined convergence as a point in your life where your greatest callings, your greatest passions, your greatest desires, your greatest skills, your greatest abilities, your winning combination of relationships, everything comes together in one moment or in one period of your life and it's expressed through a specific profession or role. Okay? This is what he defines as convergence. And he says, statistics show that the period of convergence for a lot of people is somewhere around the age of 40. <laughs> Now, <laughs> there's a lot of evidence to prove against that idea, right, in the world today. But I have seen from his research and the statistics that have been shown, there's a lot of evidence to show that this is true. But it, again, there's a lot of things behind that. There's people's upbringing. There's their self-esteem. There's whether they believe in themselves or not. There's the opportunities they've had, and so on. But meaning and convergence are an important foundational part of everything. This is the fourth principle before we begin the sessions, which I title, One is Never Enough. John Maxwell actually puts it nicely in his way. He says, one is too small a number to achieve greatness. Yeah, and it's very true. If you have a dream, the bigger your dream, the bigger and better your team has to be. If you want to touch the world, if you want to change things in your company, if you want to innovate, you need a team, either a physical team or a virtual team. And of course, there's a lot of you know, virtual remote people working remote and so on nowadays, but you need a team. This event is the result of teamwork, right? <laughs> there's lots of people that have been involved. There are people that have been involved with contacting people for the event. There's someone involved with you know, filming this event at the moment. There's technology, uh, technology questions involved with, you know, streaming this event and all these things, okay? So a team was necessary for this small event to take place. How much more a product for a company? I remember with the software companies I've worked in where we worked in cycles every, every three months, Qs, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. There's things that needed to happen. And, you know, we normally have the strategy, but what happens is if one player in the team drops the ball at one point, that's where things begin to go wrong. And all the planning and everything you did just <laughs> seems to evaporate at one point. That's why I said I'd like to help you build a flexible plan. Success is not always like this. <laughs> you know, sometimes there's, you know, challenges, things you have to avoid, obstacles you have to move around, you know, and so on. So these are the four principles. Any questions or comments? Actually, I have a question. Yes. One of the principles is being the best you can be. Right? Yes. And sometimes, you know, working with you uh, over the media, yep. you could uh, put some uh, uh, questions to your mind, and mm -hmm. you might be lost. You might think that you're the best you can be because yep. you have your favorite kind of car. Yes. Yes. Yeah, how, how, how can we make a difference? How can we say which is true and which is not? Mm -hmm. How to make sure to stick to the best you? To the best you. Well, sticking to the best you answered with, I'll give two answers to that. The first answer is to remain growth conscious. If you are growth conscious, right, you never stop achieving the goals. You are never really the best. And actually, you know, in Jim Collins' book, you know, From Good to Great, 
and <laughs> about companies, you know how they got to a certain point and they got so proud and then they fell. People that think they're at the top and stop growing, they will eventually be overtaken by others. It's the same thing in the corporate world, same thing in the business world. There's always someone at the other end of the world that's thinking, uh, thinking up an idea that's going to turn your market around. Okay? That's one thing, to be growth conscious. The second thing is there's a fallacy um, in the minds of a lot of successful people. And successful people have to avoid this because if you're successful, you're successful because you think I'm a success. I'm successful. And a lot of people would seem to think that they would be in the top 10% of their field. But if everybody's in the top 10% of their field, I mean, <laughs> who is in the 90%? Marshall Goldsmith, who's one of the biggest executive coaches in the world, he did some experiments. And in his classes, he was asking people, how many of you think you're in the top 10% of your profession? And almost the whole hall, everybody raises their hands. <clears throat> how many are in the top 5%? OK, a, less, a, a lesser number. How many are in the top 30%? Almost nobody. How many are in the top 40 or 50%? Almost nobody. He says, well, if you are in the top 10%, that means there's only 9% of people in the world you can learn from. You really have to be <laughs> really good. So that's a fallacy that successful people need to guard against because it's important to think you're a success to succeed. But at the same time, what balances it is being growth conscious. So you don't get full of yourself and you know, deceive yourself and start going backwards. And you start closing up the feedback from people that are working with you. Right? One of the mistakes of many great leaders is they uh, have not been open to feedback from people working with them. Or people working with them were too afraid of them to give feedback to their leaders. And as a result, we've had CEOs you know, <laughs> switching companies and all kinds of things happening because the people that were working with them didn't tell them the truth or the leaders themselves were not open to the truth. Let's go into the first session. <clears throat> like I said, the event is going to be hands-on. <laughs> so for the first session, for our exercises, we're going to use this sheet. It's blank. You should have at least three. Everybody should have at least three of these sheets. There are more sheets available if anybody needs them. Um, just a second. Discovery. This is the first important element I've seen when it comes to life goals. Like I said, in order to reach your full potential, you need to grow. Right? And in order to grow, you need to be self-aware. And in order to be self-aware, you also need to grow. So there are a lot of things that help. Thank you. A lot of things that help with growth itself and discovery of self. I'll give an example with myself. Years ago, when I was working with Telerik, it was my first big job, right? my first big career in IT. Uh, I joined them in 2005. At that point, the company was about 60 people and you know, was growing. But I discovered my passion is not development. I'm not a developer. I'm not a coder. I got to the point of becoming a copy-paste programmer. Okay? I can assemble things <laughs> with code, okay? if necessary. because. After Telerik, you know, I built a lot of websites. That's the thing about me. I, I'm great with technology when it comes to building things. But after that, I need to go out and meet people. I can't sit in front of a computer and code eight, nine hours a day. I, I can't do that. That's not me. So I discovered this, this wasn't me. And I began to feel dissatisfied being a developer because their products were being sold to developers. One of our team leaders, he organized a knowledge sharing event. And at that point, I was a QA. I was working with Selenium doing user-based testing, and I started learning about NUnit because, you know, we had to specialize with ASP.NET, C Sharp, you know, and all of that. So I was on the Microsoft side, the bright side. <laughs> when we had to present or teach people about what we're doing for the team, I, I felt so excited preparing for this presentation. It was like I was going to talk to a hall full of 10,000 people. I felt I was going into the zone of who I was. I was really passionate. I could hardly sleep preparing those slides so meticulously, going over the material. Everybody needs to understand what I am saying. Selenium is not the most <laughs> you know, a favorite topic of most people in IT or code. So I prepared, I prepared, I prepared. 
And on the final day of the talk, when it was my turn to speak, we had people from other teams. And I remember, as I began to speak, something happened. I listened to a talk on uh, TED Talks once. A person was talking about um, going into the zone. And he was talking about a pianist that he would play the piano at, at a point. He felt that he wasn't playing. He was just watching his hands move. I had a similar experience while talking at myself. And I was just enjoying it. I was just enjoying it. And at the end of the talk, there was such an applause. Usually the talks were dry and you know, people were, OK, when is he going to finish? But in, in that moment, I realized this is what I love doing. I love training. I love speaking. I love inspiring people. I like taking complex ideas and making them simple. I like growing people, helping them come up to a higher level. And after the talk, a friend of mine in our team came to me and he said, that was a great talk. What are you doing here? <laughs> and actually, <laughs> that helped me to think a little more. And it spurred my career in training and people development. And I went on to become a training manager. And from then on, to have a contract with Hosui starting as a trainer, I built the learning and development uh, department. I grew the team went up to being manager talent, global talent development, and it's been growing ever since. You have your moments of discovery. Another moment of discovery I remember was as a child, my elder sister had a Calypso typewriter. At that time, they were you know, really fashionable. And I remember I got her typewriter one day and I started to write because I just had so many ideas. I wanted to write. And I wrote my first novel. And I started creating comics. And I started taking part in essay competitions. And I found out that, hey, I'm good at this. I love doing this. And I've been writing ever since. And I have books that I've published, and I'm still writing books. Uh, my wife can tell you people that I just love to write for the sake of writing. <laughs> That's what I do. So these are the channels through which I express who I am, through my speaking, my training, consulting, and writing. Let's go ahead and start this exercise. We'll have about 20 minutes for it. First part of the exercise, imagine at this point in time, you're in a bubble that's outside the current existence. Imagine that you have no financial limitations. You have no mental blocks. You have no limiting mindsets. You have no limitations of any kind as to what you're going to write on, the, on this piece of paper. I would like everybody to write down for themselves at least three things that you would like to become, to do, or to have, either personally or professionally. It could be, I want to be a father of two children in 10 years and have those children in fourth grade by that time, you know, and raise them up as happy, stable children. This is a very noble goal. It's actually one of my life goals, to be a good father, to be a good husband. So it could be personal, it could be professional. So think about three things. And anything you write can happen. It can happen right now. Just imagine that it can happen right now. And then see yourself after it has happened. Imagine you're looking back on this having already happened and thinking about what happened. If you want to sit down, that's fine. If you want to walk around, that's fine. If you want to change your seat to somewhere else, whichever way is more you know, convenient for you. I'm perfectly all right with that, perfectly all right. If you have a device and you want to use your device, whatever works for you, yes. It could be life goals, personal goals. It could be professional goals. We'll come down to a plan and break things down into parts and realistic parts later on. But we'll just start out with this. 